Uh, joining us now, our old friend Byron York, chief political correspondent for the Washington Examiner, Fox News contributor. Uh, Byron, it's uh, they've been, they've gone from what Russia uh, collusion impeachment to Turnberry Resort impeachment. <laughs> what is <laughs> what's going on? And explain explain what I mean by Turnberry Resort for the listeners. All right. Well, um, everybody on uh, MSNBC got very excited a few days ago when there was a report in Politico that said that the uh, an Air Force C-17 traveling from the U.S. to Kuwait had made an odd, they used the word odd, refueling stop um, in at this little airport called uh, Prestwick Airport in Scotland, and that the crew... Uh, stayed overnight at the Turnberry Resort, which is, of course, owned by President Trump, uh, several miles away. And the idea is uh, of the story was that uh, Trump is using the U.S. military to steer money to his losing to his money losing uh, resort. And it was all based on uh, a letter that uh, Elijah Cummings, the chairman of the House. Uh, oversight committee had sent to the Pentagon, kind of laying this out, and there were things that just made you made you kind of wonder in it. Like it it, it said that the um, the uh, Air Force had had gotten so many bought so many gallons of fuel since October 17, and this had really increased since October 17. And you had to ask yourself, well, was there anything before that? I mean, when you say something has increased. You need to say what it was and then what it became. Well, even a cursory look at all this finds that the uh, the uh, Air Force, uh, uh, something called the Defense Logistics Agency, signed mm-hmm. a contract with the Presswick Airport in 2016. That was when Barack Obama was president. And actually, if you look at the arrivals um, of Air Force planes at this airport in 2015, they go up. 50% into 2016, and then they do go up again and again once Trump is president. And you have to think, was President Obama trying to prop up Donald Trump's money-losing resort? Yes. You know, it just doesn't hold. And then you look, uh, and then you look at staying at, at um, Prestwick, and it turns out Trump charged um, the Air Force less than... Marriott had charged, and um, we also found a um, an Inspector General report from um, from an earlier state. Remember, Trump went over there to uh, to Prestwick, and it was in July of 2018. And some um, some uh, State Department people stayed there. So again, Democrats in Congress ordered the State Department to tell them how much. Uh, they had spent. Well, it turns out they had three rooms for two nights, and Trump charged them $121 a night. Now, that was cheaper than the other hotels in the area. But then again, and by the way, when Democrats found this out, they kind of shut up. They didn't try to make this a big scandal. We're in this position now where somebody publishes an article, in this case Politico, MSNBC and everybody get excited about it, and they all talk about it. And it takes a while to check, okay, what really happened, how many flights really were there, what was charged, all that stuff. And then you see that the story was basically a nothing burger. But this this happens all the time. All the time. Right? And it's happened to me, so I know. it's you know It happens all the time. Some blogger will write something, cut and paste something, snip a show, edit it in a curious way. And put, slap a headline on it, and all the lemmings just follow along, jump right off the cliff. And it's so easily disproved. You know, it, it, this is interesting. There are people who are, their hobby is to go out to airports, and they make videos of planes arriving and taking off, and they post them on YouTube. Well, go to YouTube and search for USAF, for United States Air Force, and Prestwick, and you see lots of, lots of videos of United States Air Force planes landing and taking off at Prestwick in 2015 and 2016. Bunches of them. Um, I mean, the the story was just easily disprovable. And the the contract that the Obama Defense Department signed in 2016 is publicly available. All this stuff is there. 
But everybody just gets so excited, and this is Trump and the Emoluments Clause. And, of course, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez immediately demanded that Trump be impeached over uh, letting these Air Force, uh, this Air Force crew stay at Turnberry. So, you know, nobody actually even makes the most cursory glance at the facts of the case. No. Well, it's all done for... It's all done with a purpose and with an agenda, and that's what happens when you have an agenda and you're just un- not in any way interested in the factual underpinnings of what you're saying. Of course, Joe Scarborough was freaking out this morning in his typical fashion. We need to look at the United States Air Force and see how they are now directing, I mean, uh, directing millions and millions of dollars uh, uh, Trump's way for this airport that actually helps Donald Trump out helps helps uh, his his business out uh, to a tune of, of what what do they say 17, 17 million dollars in refueling yeah it, that's tax yeah. payer money Byron <laughs> well they refuel somewhere when you fly from Kuwait <laughs> to the United States you refuel somewhere and the Pentagon the Air Force actually said these are agreed upon contractual fuel rates. Um, I haven't seen anybody suggest that they're a lot higher than what the refueling rate would have been somewhere else. Um, the United States has used Prestwick for a long time. Um, uh, the U.S. Air Force sent me some stuff when I was writing about it, uh, showing that um, in terms of the air traffic, it's uh, a better place to land. Prestwick is always... Uh, prided itself on being a, quote, fog-free airport, which mm-hmm. there aren't many of those in Scotland just because of p- particular geographic um, circumstances around it. And, um, the, you know, the Air Force makes a perfectly natural, normal case for doing this. And, by the way, it's not like all planes are stopping in Prestwick. I mean, the U.S. Air, Air, uh, Air Force planes are stopping all over the world. And if you look at what a top general said when he... You know, after a, after a controversy like this, what do you do? You say, well, we're going to investigate it. I mean, the, the general said, look, everything was done by the book. Everything's within, you know, per diem and normal cost range. But, you know, the appearances of this, we have to be sensitive to that, too, so we're going to look into it. So in other words, no problem of substance at all. But since everybody's yelling about it in the media, we think there's an appearance issue, so we'll look into it. Yeah, well, again, it's, it speaks to their lack of... Uh, any type of objectivity. And I, I, I've got to say, Byron, I think people are really tired of of this relentless drumbeat. I mean, I think they're weary of it. I really do. That's just the sense I'm getting. Maybe I'm wrong, but... Yeah, they t- they tune it out. It's, yeah. it's just, oh, oh, what's new? Um, and, you know, I have to say, I do some of that, too. It's kind of yeah. natural. Um, I, I read this article about Prestwick, and some things just didn't seem right about it. Right, it seemed and a little so, too easy. Well, it seemed, it seemed a little too perfectly set up. Yeah, yeah. But, I, you know, ordinary, normal people who are not in the news business, uh, I think they, yeah, they, they do just kind of right? turn this off because and, it's just over and over and over again. Right, and that's what social media is hoping, I think, uh, in 2020, that they, you know, they post a snippet. It gets no one reads anything anymore. We know no one reads an article. I mean, rarely. Uh, you you wrote this really in depth analysis of this, and like we read it, but I bet a lot of people don't read. That's a sad. That's a sad fact. By the way, speaking of the impeachment issue, this is Congressman Steve Cohen, who's the uh, you know the rat terrier of the of the Democrat impeachment caucus. Let's listen. We're trying to produce the evidence that is, I think, clear. There have been multiple violations that would warrant impeachment. Is there a smoking gun? I think there's an arsenal, a garrison. If we bring the public opinion up greater, I think the leadership will be for us having a vote and maybe even taking action. How how many times have we heard that? As a matter of fact, we got reports now that Congress has has come back from their, I don't know, six-year recess or whatever it was. Uh, Now that they've come back, that the House Judiciary Committee is going to vote on some procedures for an impeachment and that they believe they don't come out and say this but it's pretty obvious they think well the Mueller report just didn't do it for us so we need to add some things to it we need to add the stormy daniels Karen mcdougall situation 
and with and, and uh, accused the president of campaign finance violations, which is a pretty iffy case right there. Um, and we need to throw in some emoluments. I mean, why not? Let's throw in this Presswood case. There's nothing to it, but let's throw that in too. So it's, it's clear they're trying to broaden the case against Trump because Russia was uh, not the sort of kill shot that they were looking for. Now, again, uh, and, it, and it's cutting against what their own voters want. Democrats and Republicans are solidly against an impeachment of this well, president. Well, part of this part of this change in strategy is to deal with those uh, Democrats, and we, we know. I mean, in 2018, there were a number of Democrats uh, elected in districts that Trump had won, and they're not interested in supporting impeachment. They didn't get elected uh, promising impeachment, and they don't want to run in 2020, you know, bragging about how they impeached the president, who's also on the ballot. Um, so, it, it, when you when you hear Steve Cohen talk about this. He's not talking about we're hoping Republicans will all get along with us, come along with us. He's saying we're hoping we can get the Democrats together behind this. No, it's just, uh, again, the Democrat agenda is hope for a recession and the absence of a recession just continue to hit this idea that, you know, Trump's, I guess, running for reelection just to make himself rich, even though he clearly has lost a lot of money. He's clearly lost you know, a lot of really, money being president. That would be an interesting article. Wouldn't that be an interesting article? He probably wouldn't like it, uh, the president, because he doesn't like anyone to th- think he's losing money. But he's – I bet he's lost a lot of cash uh, just in his business running for president. And that was a, that was a decision he made. Yeah. And, so it's and, the opposite you know, of what they're saying. When you become a partisan figure, yeah. I mean, businesses try to appeal to everybody. Right. Uh, and when you become a partisan figure, you don't. Uh, by the way, on this on this recession stuff, this is another be in the bonnet sort of topic. You know, the Washington Post comes out with this new poll, so the president uh, has his uh, uh, his approval rating has fallen amid fears of recession. And an hour later, the Post publishes a story with the headline: "U.S. poverty rate fell to lowest since 2001." Um, they since changed that. To, to reflect that uh, the number of people who are uninsured has gone up. So mm-hmm. they found some bad news to emphasize here. But the, there continues to be uh, significant, solid, good economic news, and there are these, these, mm-hmm. these you know, kicks that the, the media goes on. Remember, it happened in the last couple of months of 2018, back in October, November, December of 2018. There was a lot of speculation that a recession was right around the corner, and it wasn't. So then we've, in the last month, last two or three weeks, certainly we've had some very intense talking uh, predictions of a recession. Did you ever hear as much discussion of the um, yield inversion curve? The never. inverted yield curve that yep. uh, it, it, we, most people never heard of it. It just became basically, basically it's negative time. interest rates. It's basically it's, it's, it's negative a interest predictor rates. for yeah. for a um, for a recession. And now the Washington Post, amazingly enough, you, the, the media goes nuts about talking about a recession. And then they take a poll and they say fears of a recession are up. And you think, well, how did that happen? Yeah. So here we and, and then of course fears of the recession are contributing to the president's unpopularity. So there is there's an obvious circularity uh, to all of this, and uh, it's just going to continue and intensify, of course. Byron, uh, I have to ask year. you. I have to ask you about the goofball challenge by Sanford, Mark Sanford. Yeah, yeah. Of the president. I mean, for for the president, of course. I can't just let it go. I mean, Mark Sanford is such a nothing. But the president has to smash him yesterday on Twitter. He's like, well, his, his, what did he say? His flaming dancer instead of flamenco dancer, his flaming <laughs> dancer. I thought that was actually like a pun or something. Then I realized he meant flamenco dancer. Not flamingo, flamenco. <laughs> Not flamingo. Yeah. All right. Well, here's here's the thing. The president now has three primary challengers. He has Mark Sanford, he has Joe Walsh, and he has Bill Weld. Now, if, if you've listened to some Democrats, and especially to some never-Trumpers, 
they will say, I'm, I'm, I can talk about this, I, I, I'm writing, as, we, as we're talking, I'm writing a piece about this very issue. I talked to Pat Buchanan about it uh, yesterday, and I'm uh, putting some of that in this, in this piece. But anyway, you have these three challengers, and you've heard a lot of never-Trumpers say, no president in the last 50 years who has been challenged in the primary has gone on to win re-election. And uh, they point to George H.W. Bush in 1992, who was challenged by Buchanan. And then they point to uh, Jimmy Carter in 1980, who was challenged by Teddy Kennedy. Uh, Gerald Ford in 1976, who was challenged by Ronald Reagan. And go back to 1968, and Lyndon Johnson p- withdraws from the race when he's challenged by Bobby Kennedy. And you think to yourself, Bobby Kennedy, Ted Kennedy... Ronald Reagan, Mm -hmm. these are pretty big figures. They were all people at the height of their political powers when they decided to challenge a president. And then you see Pat Buchanan, 1992, a legend among conservatives at that time, a White House aide, a commentator, uh, a television personality. And then you think Bill Welt, Joe Walsh, Mark Sanford. (laughs) Is there a stature gap between today's challengers of President Trump and the the primary challengers of yore? Clearly there is. Um, Mm. And so I I think that we're looking at pretty much a a big nothing in these primary challenges. What is Evan McMuffin doing? What is McMuffin doing? Oh, you know, I don't know. Uh, Has he found the egg and cheese and the bacon? (laughs) Well, you know that was a, I mean that was a kind of an amazing story back in 2016 when some never trumpers were trying to recruit uh, a candidate to run against candidate Donald Trump and they you know they wanted Mitt Romney to do it and then they wanted Ben Sass to do it and then I think they wanted Tom Coburn to do it and eventually they got down to David French the National Review writer and he said no um, and they ended up with uh, Evan Mullen, who was a, a former CIA person. And I don't have the exact number in front of me. I think he got nationally about 700,000 votes. Obviously, the, the two big candidates got 60 to 63 million apiece. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, if you look at the FEC report, which is kind of interesting, about a year after the, the election, they print, they print a report and they, 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 uh, they say... They note every single vote in the race. Uh, Evan McMullen got slightly more than the category of miscellaneous write-ins. So if you wrote in, like, Tom Brady to be president or, you know, Beyonce to be president, mm-hmm. um, that's in miscellaneous write-ins. And Evan McMullen did nip them by just a little bit. Yeah, well, again, it's in a close election where we have uh, – in. Florida, we have a lot of new voters from uh, Hurricane Maria, transplants from Puerto Rico, yep. thousands. Uh, that could be having an effect in Florida, even though Ron DeSantis is 60-plus points in popularity, which is impressive. No, um, the, not- the, the, uh, the people from, uh, from Puerto Rico is a huge thing because you move from Puerto Rico to Florida, you can vote immediately. I mean, there's no – they're U.S. citizens. They're, you know, come to Florida and start voting in Florida. That's, that's just not – an issue. Uh, And Florida is always close. I mean, Trump, I believe, won Florida over Clinton by a larger margin than Obama won Florida over uh, Romney. But in in every case, it's it's really pretty close, and I would imagine it's going to be the same thing this time. Byron York, thank you so much. Uh, It's always great to talk to you, and great reporting.